there, but she doesn't do that because she's on radio and doesn't have Zane. All right, good evening, everybody. This is the formal good evening, so uh, I think there'll be a few more people trickling in as they find their way here. But, you know, it's a, it's a new location, so, um, and I know people didn't know really where this facility was, but it's a pretty cool room. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. So we're going to be here next week, too, at 7 o'clock for the Harding Letters program. But tonight, it's the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan was alive and well in nearly every Ohio city, including Marion, during the 1920s. What made seemingly ordinary, decent citizens join, or at least condone the group? We're going to explore that question tonight. Klan most of us think of, the Klan of Reconstruction following the Civil War, was about violence, intimidation, death if necessary, and terror. For Klansmen, even though they wouldn't admit it, it was all about fear. Fear they had in themselves. Fear of a changing world. Fear of a loss of power. I forgot our question. That's all. Is that better? That's yeah. good. Okay. Sherry, is there a test on this class? Yes, there will be a test. Okay. <laughs> Fear of a loss of power, fear of losing a way of life. We usually think of crosses burning in the front yards of black families, or in the yards of whites supporting a limited liberation of blacks. We think of lynchings. We think of the South. Some of those images we have in our minds actually came from a second wave of planned popularity in this country, a wave that began in 1915 and ebbed greatly by the end of the 1920s. Those burning crosses, those weren't used until the New Era Klan. Lynchings certainly occurred in the first Klan, but they were prevalent in the New Era. The New Era Klan was invented on Thanksgiving night in 1915 by William Joseph Simmons in a dramatic ceremony on Stone Mountain in Georgia. A cross burn that night became the symbol of the New Era Klan. Simmons' father had been in the original Klan, and he had grown up hearing exciting tales of the Knights of the Klan bringing truth and justice to the countryside after the northern carpetbaggers and unjust northern rule threatened to bend the spirit of the South. The impetus for taking action, though, was his recent viewing of the controversial silent movie, The Birth of a Nation. A fan of the secrecy and rituals of fraternal organizations, Simmons belonged to 15 fraternal organizations including the Masons and Knights Templar. He moved from Alabama to Atlanta when his job, he got a job promoting the Woodmen of the World. He worked on mapping out the Klan's ritualistic ceremonies in his spare time. He saw the Klan as a way to unite Protestant America against the degener degenerative forces threatening the American way of life. Those forces were immigrants, Jews, Catholics, non-Anglo-Saxons, he thought urban areas also bred evil and said the real America has always been country America. He thought if he exposed evil, an irate public would destroy it. Now he had no real plan of action. He liked the ceremony, but he didn't have a lot of substance. So he hired a pair of uh, PR people, Edward Clark and Mrs. Elizabeth Tyler, not to be confused with Elizabeth Taylor, <laughs> in 1920 to run a PR campaign. His message was to live a clean life, and that appealed to people uncomfortable with the social changes which are, went along with the move from a predominantly rural society to an urban one. He attacked the elite, urbanites, and intellectuals. So this is very much a middle-class white movement. The Klan spread from Stone Mountain, Georgia, in every direction. The door opened for the Klan because of World War I, because of the great migra migration of blacks to the northern states, because of the influx of immigrants arriving from Europe, and because society and the world was changing. Movies seemed vulgar. Music was racy. Women's skirts were shorter. The public schools seemed to be backing away from Christian values. The Klan offered a way to fight against change and fight against fear. Now this shows
shows you the states with the largest Klan membership from 1915 to 1944. And what's interesting is the Klan was in all 48 states during this time period. But look where Ohio ranks. We are number two. And we are have a larger contingent of Klansmen than anybody in the South. So this is a very topsy-turvy kind of event than the era clan. Very different than that post-reconstruction clan. The clan moved into Ohio from Indiana, seemingly invading the state from the southwest. Every county had a clan presence, and although it was heavier in some counties than others, it's very difficult to put a number to how many clansmen were in a county because they didn't have public member rosters. But the more active Klan counties, judging from Klan publicity and newspaper coverage, were Hamilton, Franklin, Licking, Fairfield, Allen, Wood, and Union counties. Marion, too, had an official Klan group. Summit County had the largest local Klan chapter in the country with 50,000 members, including included in many of the Klan groups, such as the one in Summit County, were city and county officials. Now, each group was organized by a man called a Klegel, and that Klegel was paid by the Klans to organize an individual chapter in a community. They were very well paid, and they traveled from community to community, recruiting new members, starting new chapters. They were paid a base salary plus a commission for each new member. So the Klegel would go into a community, such as Marion, such as Mansfield, any of the ones in Ohio, and study the community. They'd have lunch at the local diners. They would talk to a lot of the citizens, looking for its weak spots, its prejudices, its sore spots. In many smaller Ohio communities, that meant resentment well, the resentment of the Great Migration, which brought thousands of blacks north for factory jobs, prejudice toward recent immigrants, who were perceived also to be communists, that all kind of intermingled together, resentment of those thought to be in control of the economy, which generally were Jews, and suspicion about Catholics who were thought to have more allegiance to the Pope than to the American government. The Klan espoused itself as the caretaker of society. It denounced most motion pictures, as we've said, was a supporter of prohibition, and also was a supporter of suffrage for women because they wanted their women members to vote for Klan candidates and their issues. The new jazz music prevalent in the early 20s was a part of the dirty living that the Klan rallied against, which also included the elite and urbanites. All of this appealed to people, especially those on farms and small towns, who were all uncomfortable with the rapid social change going on. But one thing we need to keep in mind is the Klan did not exploit anything which wasn't already there. They are not brainwashing anybody. They're just playing up the feelings that already exist. Now, they wanted to be seen as any other fraternal organization. They wanted to be seen as the Masons, the Elks, the Eagles, the Knights of Columbus. They just said that their group was for white Protestant men. Now they did have a women's auxiliary as well, but the women could not join the main clan group. And this is one of their advertisements here, portraying them as a protector of women and children. And indeed, protecting womanhood was a big tenet that they really emphasized a lot, that they excused a lot based on uh, what they were doing to protect womanhood. <clears throat> they were intent on building a better community, they said. They tended to like public shows of community care. They wanted everybody to see what they were doing. In Butler, Ohio, 17 masked Klansmen visited the Methodist Episcopal Church, presenting the minister with an American flag and a Bible. In Mifflin, Ohio, nine Klansmen visited Mifflin United Brethren Church and did the same thing. 
They gave money to black churches, often breaking into a worship service and walking up the aisle to the minister to hand him a bag of money. They sponsored festivals, parades, lectures, musical programs. In Akron, the Klan donated Bibles and flags to a whole high school and succeeded in getting Bible study added to the school curriculum. They prepared baskets of food for the poor to be giving out at Christmas and gave away clothes to the needy. Communities couldn't help but notice the new player in town, and recognition came even from the pulpit. In Mansfield, the Reverend O. L. Kiplinger of the First Congregational Church opened his sermon on December 18, 1922, a little differently than usual. He said the Ku Klux Klan has come to Mansfield. According to its announcements, it claims its members must be 100% American. It promises to bring about a lot of reforms that would be welcome to the right-thinking citizen. It says it's going to wipe out bootlegging, clean up bad movies, restore the old Southern sense of chivalry, and protect womanhood, drive the Catholic back into his church, stop the encroachment of the Jap and the Jew, and put the Negro in his place. Without question, some one or all of these themes will make appeal to many minds, and I do not question the statement that men of all ranks and grades, men of business, men of the professions, and some of the clergy are joining the Klan. And indeed, the church, as we're going to see, different Protestant churches are going to be a big component of each community's Klan membership. Opposing the Klan sometimes backfired. In Springfield, the police charged a Klan organizer with riotous conspiracy and raided the local Klan headquarters. After the raid, 500 new members joined the Klan. The Klan was viewed by its members no differently than any other social or fraternal organization. You had picnics with fellow members, had Klan festivals, gathered at conclaves, which were their their group, big group gatherings, and had a lot of parades, a lot of parades. One of the most popular places for the Klan to gather in the Midwest was at Buckeye Lake. David Stevenson, the Grand Dragon of Indiana, was a part-time resident of Buckeye Lake. So, of course, he organized a lot of the conclaves, the big state and regional meetings to be held there. Two state conclaves were held there, one in 23, the second in 25 with 70,000 Klansmen attending each one. The 23 event included an initiation, they called them a naturalization ceremony, for 1,700 new members against a backdrop of several 40-foot electric crosses and thousands of Klansmen holding candles and forming a human cross. At midnight, fireworks were fired from barges on the lake. And it was also a place where you could have clan weddings, such as our couple featured in this picture here. And this picture of the Ferris wheel is not from Ohio, it's from Colorado, but the same period of time. And I just uh, find it creepily amusing, so I put it in there. The clans been all in their robes and hoods riding the Ferris wheel. I see it. <clears throat> Now, politics and business also mixed with the Klan in communities across Ohio. The Klan found that infiltrating local politics quickly advanced their cause. In Youngstown, local leaders opposed the Klan until they saw it as a tool to push Protestant moral reform. Within two years, the mayor was a Klan supporter. Many other Ohio towns followed suit with Klan candidates. H.N. Stevens, running as an independent with Klan backing, was elected mayor of Newark. Even Marion had a Klan candidate. In 1924, the Reverend M.L. Buckley, pastor of the Christian Church on West Church Street, that was between Union and Orchard Streets, had the backing of the Klan for the mayor's race. He ran as a Republican, but he complained that the Republican City Committee did not help him win the election. The Klan often criticized local police departments as not being strong enough in curbing the undesirables, but sometimes did accurately accuse departments of being on the take, especially when it came to bootleggers. They often offered to take up arms to clean up the streets, which put them at odds with both the community and the police. In Steubenville, the Klan went so far as to ask Ohio Governor Donahue to remove the police chief and the mayor. 
saying the police were not doing their job to clean up graft and vice, and the mayor was inept. The governor, governor did not reply. The Klan sometimes took more extreme measures than just boycotting your business if you were Catholic or were host, openly hostile to the Klan. In Lima, a restaurant owner was arrested by the Klan, and he went missing for a week. He shows up, beaten up, in Niagara Falls, New York. The local Klansman in Springfield admitted to relocating him, saying they objected to the location of his business. The Klan also touched the General Assembly in Ohio's government. In 1923, the House defeated an anti-Klan bill for the second time, which would have prohibited persons from masking their faces in public or wearing the regalia of any secret organization. The House previously had to be defeated a bill seeking to make public Klan members' names. So whether it was fear even on part of the legislature, we don't know. To show you how prominent the Klan was, by 1924, here are the covers of Time magazine, which has Pope Pius XI on the left, the week of June 16, 24, and then Hiram Wesley, the imperial wizard of the KKK, a week later, and then William Howard Taft, the third week. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about an extreme amount of influence here. And here's your membership card. And I know you can't read it too much. So you're going to get this after the Klegel organizes the chapter in your town. And then you can sign this uh, membership card. If they approve you, then you'll be taken in for the next installation. And it was a matter of customization in each town. As I said, they, they worked to figure out what the weak spot was. In the western part of the country, there's an anti-Mormon feeling. So that's what they played up there. In the south, it was mostly anti-black. In the Midwest, it's anti-Catholic and anti-Jew. In the Northeast, it's anti-Jew. So each part of the country had its own clan agenda that was its strong suit in recruiting members, but ultimately it was going to weaken the entire clan as an organization, which we'll see. The Klegels targeted fraternal organizations who already had large memberships, the Masons, the Elks, the Woodmen of America, and they loved to infiltrate the churches. Especially vulnerable to the clan message were Disciples of Christ, Baptists, United Brethren, and Methodists. A typical new recruit was active in his church and a member of at least one charitable organization. And don't forget the wife and kids. Women could join the clan auxiliary, and yes, hoods and robes came in toddler sizes. They even tried to organize a couple of chapters with black members in Youngstown. It didn't work for some reason. <laughs> a new clan member played, paid $16.50 to join, with $10 going to the Klan organization, $650 went for your robe and hood. That would be $213 in today's economy, and that was kind of a large chunk for a middle class family. The robes were made in Atlanta in a Klan owned business. So that's where you're, you're, you, she told them what size you needed, and they'd ship it there from Atlanta. The certificate above says, I, the undersigned, a native-born, true, and loyal citizen of the United States of America, being a white, male, Gentile person of temperate habits, sound in mind, and a believer in the tenets of the Christian religion, the maintenance of white supremacy, and the principles of a pure Americanism, do most respectfully apply for membership in the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Sounds like and we're going to bring President Harding into this because you've noticed that the years we're talking about, 21, 22, 23, of course, is during his presidency. So we're going to insert him and see where, what he's doing in this. The Klan made being president much harder. Simply put, the Klan was a thorn in President Harding's side and would torment President Coolidge and to a less than ex extent the Hoover administration. A perusal through Marion Stars of the late teens and 20s do not reveal much in the way of coverage 
of plan events. It's obvious that the editorial policy was to ignore the group as much as possible. There are a few paint ads, but as far as news stories, there's not a lot there. It published significantly less planned news than did neighboring newspapers, such as the Mansfield News. From the start of his administration, President Harding was also going to be a thorn in the side of the Klan. He tried to push Congress to enact an anti-lynching law right off the bat. Always it was blocked by Southern Democrats. It would be blocked for decades by Southern Democrats. The Klan issue, the race issue, came to a head in October 21 when Harding visited Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham was a new city in the South, founded in 1871 after the Civil War. It quickly grew from a dusty crossroads at the intersection of two rail lines into an industrial powerhouse, buoyed by the discovery of one of the world's richest deposits of hematite in the nearby Appalachian foothills. In 1907, U.S. Steel came to town, and in 1915, the lock system on two rivers was completed providing Birmingham with cheap transportation all the way to Mobile on the Gulf Coast. By anyone's definition, Birmingham was a boom town and lived up to its nickname of the Magic City. Against this backdrop, then, Warren Harding arrives October 21, 1921. He is to speak at Woodrow Wilson Park, recently renamed for the previous president. And he is to congratulate Birmingham on doing such a fine job in advancing their city in their short history and becoming a face of the New South with new industry. Close to 11.30 a.m. on the morning of October 21st, Warren and Florence Hardy made their way to the nearby park. And Hardy settled himself behind the podium and began his address to a huge crowd of 100,000 people. A segregated crowd, I might add. <coughs> Chain link fence down the middle of the grounds. He talked about how far Birmingham had come, how it represented the New South, how it was the epitome of progress. The Birmingham officials beamed with pride. He could have ended things right there. He could have exited the podium in triumph, kind of like the end of a Van Halen experience shouting, thank you, Birmingham, and tossed his guitar pick into the crowd. <laughs> However, there's a second part of the speech that is the most prolific. It packed a punch. In this speech, Harding spoke about race relations in this country. He said it was a national problem, not a regional southern problem. He said it was not going to be solved by individual states in the South or individual communities the way they wanted it to be solved. He says, it has come to the forefront, we need to address it all together. He asked for three things for all Americans, regardless of the color of their skin. He asked for political equality, educational equality, and economic equality. And when he's talking about economic equality, he says, I mean it in precisely the same way and to the same extent that I would mean it if I spoke of equality of economic opportunities between members of the same race. In each case, I would mean equality proportioned to the honest capacities and deserts of the individual. So based on, on each person's abilities, they have that chance. Educational equality is in a world where the law of the land is separate but equal. Okay? In the north, in Ohio, our schools were not segregated. In the south, they certainly were, and they were anything but equal. He is asking for equal educational opportunity for both races. And he says, even men of the same race do not accomplish an equality. Everyone has their own abilities, but they need that door to be opened. As far as political equality, too, he says, I would say let the black man vote when he's fit to vote, prohibit the white man voting when he is unfit to vote. Again, that equality, letting people have the opportunity. The sticky wicket is the socially separate part. Nobody in 1921 America 
or throughout the 20s is talking about social integration. The black leaders are not, the white leaders are not, the president is not. That is beyond anybody's imagination. They, those leaders of both races uh, want social equality, but they realize that they are separate races and they need to have black leaders lead the black population. And Harding very much says that there is space for black leaders in his administration. But they are not talking about integration. That, that isn't even in their scope of, of realization at all. Well, we had some reaction, good and bad. This is the Columbia, South Carolina State newspaper. They're not happy. It has permitted us to at least conjecture by what possible kink in the convolutions of the brain the president was moved to make his Birmingham address on the question of the Negro. What was the uncomprehensible urge that moved him to do the most inappropriate, the most unwise thing possible? Obviously, they are shell-shocked. And the reaction at Woodrow Wilson Park was much the same. There was silence when he was done. A few scattered clappings from the people on the black side of the fence. Most of the whites are silent. The newspaper editorials came fast and furious, as did the letters to the White House. While many of the reaction was positive, certainly not was all. Black leaders, though, seemed to sense some momentum. In the Boston Globe, they're kind of cutting to the, the chase here. They applaud the speech, but said that Harding was equally wise in his frank rejection of social equality. Half suppressed desires for social equality and for a mixture of races can lead only to tragedy and to destruction. Nobody can even imagine such a thing. Well, the Klan reacts, as we could expect. This is Colonel J.G. Camp, and he was hired by the Klan as a mouthpiece. He's a great speaker. He goes to rallies. He speaks at all kinds of Klan events, all their conclaves, and there is a PR campaign against the president after the Birmingham speech. And in 26 major newspapers across the country, there was an article suggested that Harding and perhaps some members of his administration were actually members of the Klan. Now there's a reason they did this. They are putting the White House on the defensive. So now the Harding White House has to worry about denying this allegation, because they're getting letters from all the constituents in Ohio and across the nation. Is this true? I read in my newspaper that you're a member of the Klan. Is this true? And so we've got Harry Doherty, his attorney general, denying Klan connections. We've got Harding saying he's against the Klan. And he is reacting in that article to a letter um, by Mrs. Frank Applegate of Medford, Oregon. And she is sharing the answer she received from the president with her local newspaper. And this is the president addressing her. My dear Mrs. Applegate, your letter of April 12th to the president is received. You may be very sure, well actually this is George Christian, his uh, personal secretary. You may be very sure that any statement of the president's interest in or approval of the Ku Klux Klan is a complete and egregious, thank you, egregious, misrepresentation of the president's attitude. In some quarters, it has even been represented that the president is a member of this organization. Not only is that untrue, but the fact is the president heartily disapproves of the organization and has repeatedly expressed himself to this effect. But that doesn't end even people today thinking that he is a Klansman. This is where it came from all these decades later. August 23, we know it in Marion as the time when the president died, on August 2nd. Well, on August 10th is the day of the funeral here in Marion. And there is a very small little note in the Marion Star that a floral arrangement from the Klan was delivered to the yard of Dr. G.T. Harding, the president's father, 
where the president's body was uh, lay in state for our viewing by the local population. Says a florist truck drove up to the Harding home, meaning Dr. Harding's home, shortly before noon and unloaded a fiery cross made all out of floral, floral arrangements, flowers. Five feet high, bearing the white letters on the cross arm, KKK. A note written in a small hand was signed, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. The cross was made of red lilies and flaming scarlet straw flowers. It was placed on the edge of the lawn near the dozens of other large wreaths, so silently and quickly that few were aware of its presence until after the florist truck had driven away. So even in this time of mourning, they want to be seen as part of the community. They want to everyone to know they are also paying tribute. And it didn't remain in the yard very long. This brings us to Mary. We need to see what the clan was doing here. And it was here, and it was thriving. Now this is a, a few items that were in the Marian Star that give us a little indication of what's going on. As I said, there wasn't an amount of, a large amount of coverage in the Star about the Klan. That was a conscious editorial decision. There is a, an article on this page saying that a delegation of about 18 members of the Klan in their hoods and robes appeared at the Bell Fountain Avenue Evangelical Church Sunday evening just before the sermon and presented the congregation a purse to be applied to the building fund for the erection of a new church. So just like we've seen this tactic, I don't know if I can make it go lower. I, I don't know how to control this screen there. And um, just like we've seen in other towns in Ohio, they are interrupting church services and presenting money. The Reverend C.W. Ruhlman, the pastor, accepted the gift, and then the men left immediately afterwards. That is the Bell Fountain Avenue Evangelical Mission at the corner of Bell Fountain and Henry Streets. Then there's a notice that there's an important meeting of the Klansmen at Old Wesley Methodist Church. It just says, be there. And they became a regular chartered organization of Marion County, and they were Klan number 53 of the realm of Ohio, and they put a legal ad in the Marion Star. To the citizens of Marion County, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, now being a regular chartered organization of Marion County, it's desired that the citizens of this county be informed concerning the masked regalia of the Klan. Marion County Klansmen will not appear with the mask down from now on in Marion County except by special order. So they're apparently adopting a friendlier uh, persona, I guess. I don't know what they're really doing. They wrote an anonymous letter to the Star, a rather a threatening letter. I gathered in the research I had done, I don't know what the exact nature of the threat was. And all the star said is, the star is in receipt of a Ku Klux Klan communication, which it will be very glad to print if the writer will sign his name or authorize the use instead of that of his Klan title, as the latter does not take it out of the class of anonymous communications and the star does not print anonymous communications. So the star during this period did get criticized by the Klan for not supporting them and, and in fact actively going after them in some cases. Another item, a number of women members of the Klan attended the services at Emanuel Baptist Church in a body Sunday evening. The state organizer of the women's organization gave an address and they present the superintendent of the Sunday school with a purse of $15. And then they sang several songs and had the men's glee club round out their program. Well, this church is Emmanuel Baptist Mission, which was on the southeast corner of Fairview and North Main Streets. And in a very strange turn of events, the Ku Klux Klan volunteers to aid the police chief in policing the town. And Mayor Neely, who is the father of Esther Neely DeWolf, Esther is married to, was married to Marshall DeWolf, Florence Harding's son, if you follow all that. Mayor Neely 
receives a letter from the clan. And it says, knowing as we do that you are handicapped with a small police force, and after the outrages committed in our fair city and county last night, I don't know what happened. I couldn't find anything that referred to what happened. We wish to offer the services of from one to 1,500 of the best American-born men in the city and county. That's all in caps, so apparently we're supposed to shout that part. To work with your chief of police in helping rid the city of the crime which now exists. We know with this number of citizens acting as free agents and patrolling the streets of Marion and the county roads, these men will soon be driven from this location. The mayor turned down the offer. He said, I'm not going to start deputizing people and we're not going to start patrolling everything with uh, kind of ragamuffins here. This is a naturalization ceremony, an initiation of new members, if you will, and if you can read the, you, know, you might be able to read it up there, this is in Meeker. <laughs> this is just west of Meeker and just west of the town center there, and this was in 19, let's see, 1922. And this house belonged to Oliver Walters. He lives there with his wife, Ella, and their three children, who are pretty young. The oldest is nine. Walter, Walters is 45 years old at the time, and he's originally from Illinois, but he is hosting this event. Um, the photographer is from Kenton, Ohio. So the, the photographer's there, and Oliver has invested in one of the new lighted clan crosses. <coughs> to have up above his home. Now this house doesn't stand anymore. The barn does. Um, there's another house on the same location. Um, there was a fire in 1944. Uh, the Wenning family lived there by that time. And there was a fire in the 40s. They used some of the bricks to build the smaller house that stands there now. So these initiations were spectacles. Full regalia, hoods and robes, lighted crosses, mysterious traditions. And an initiation usually, this is a pretty small one, an initiation usually attracted 20,000 people. In Columbus, 15,000. In Shelby, another 10,000. And this is very typical of what would happen in the outskirts of Marion not in Marion proper, but certainly around the county every once in a while. Now, I blew up a little bit of this picture because there's a couple interesting things here. In the left photo, can you see there's an Indian, a Native American there with a headdress on? Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't explain what he's doing there because you wouldn't think that the Klan would be buddies with Native Americans. They're against anybody other than whites. I don't know what he's doing there. I think it's interesting, but I, I don't understand it. And right in front of the Native American, there are several young girls sitting there. And the picture of the right also shows a, young children. So this is very much a family event. But the, uh, the uh, Native American really did uh, surprise me. There is an article in the 1925 American Journal of Sociology, and a writer by the name of Frank Vaughn published this article. He interviewed a Marion County Klan leader who wasn't identified. He only was described as a farmer owning about 60 acres of land. But this is what he said. He says, the country is in danger. It is ruled by Catholics and Jews. The Jews control the moving picture houses and Catholics 80% of the newspapers. The movies are immoral. Young girls are not safe on country roads. They're picked up by men in automobiles. Then the Jews sell them as white slaves. We want the country ruled by the sort of people who originally settled it. This is our country and we alone are responsible for its future. Now, as I was researching, actually I was looking for Oliver Walters' farm and everything. I was using 
the 1918 and 1923 directory of Marion County, which comprised the owners of the rural areas of Marion County. And they gave us this, these statistics. There's 42,000 citizens of Marion County. Tell us how many in the city. Only 239 blacks because they have mostly left Marion in 1919. And Phil Reed wrote a book about this, about the murder of a woman on David Street and of course a, a black man was railroaded into uh, the blame for that when really it was the woman's husband. So there was a lot of black flight from Marion in 1919. They make a note that there are 1,655 people with one or two parents of foreign birth, just in case I guess you want that statistic. Now the introduction, just like any city or county directory, <coughs> tells you this information and I'm reading along. They say there's 2,100 farms covering 409 square miles, 92% of the county's farmland. Tell you that number one crop is corn, then oats, wheat, and potatoes. Then the middle of this, it says, the farm population of Marion County is almost exclusively native born white. And it went with nothing that was listed in here. And then it went back to citing specifics. So even in something as innocuous as a directory, we find that thinking there, that we have to differentiate. And apparently needed to be proud of the fact that there weren't that many immigrants. Now, this is going to be an interesting story here. You recognize this building, maybe, as the old Marion Star Building. And before it got in the hands of the Marion Star, it had an interesting history. It was originally built by the Knights of Columbus in the early 20s. Not completed, they didn't have money to complete it. They had grand plans for it. It was gonna have a swimming pool in the basement. It had an auditorium, which I could tell you that building had an auditorium. Um, it was supposed to be a social club of sorts. On the first ground floor was a marketplace. So, uh, fruits, vegetables, that kind of thing. So the Knights of Columbus bought this, couldn't finish it, they only have it about a year and a half. The Klan <laughs> said that they ran the marketplace business out, out of business because it was Catholic and they got people to boycott it. I can't confirm whether that's true or not. So the Knights of Columbus want to sell it and they sell it to a group of men who give the KFC promissory notes, each calling for the sum of $10,000 with an annual interest rate of 6% to purchase the building. The first note was paid, so they still owed $50,000. So I want you to see who these guys are. These are our players. Actually, there's seven of them. Byron Wilson, He's 41, he lives on Columbia Street. He's the president of Iman Crossing Company, which I have no idea what that is. Albert Linscott, he's 65, he's on South State Street, he's a dentist. George Gretzer, he's 36, he lives on Wildwood Court, he's a repair manager at the shovel. John Jolly, he's 40, he lives on South High Street, he's a barber. Clement Orr, he's 56, he lives on South Prospect Street, he's a pattern maker at the shovel. C.C. Robinette, I couldn't find. Ralph Tibault, 25, he lives on Evans Road. He's an erector at the Osgood Shovel. And this photo was provided to me from uh, Randy Winland, and it shows that same building back in its earlier days before it was covered with that exterior when the star had it. And we can see those, that marketplace kind of storefronts on the first floor. So these guys all buy this. And in two months, they flip the building. And they flip it to a new group. And that group is the Klan. So, mm -hmm. this building goes from the KSC to ownership by the Klan. While the building was under construction by the KSC, this is the Klan, 
One of our <coughs> clansmen jokingly told one of the contractors to be sure and build a good building as the clan would own it someday. To which a Catholic gentleman standing near retorted, not as long as a Catholic lives in Marion, but strange as fate, this is the clan still talking. Six months later, we owned the building, the first KFC building in the United States to be taken over by the clan. So you can imagine when folks in Marion found out what this ruse was and learned that it was really the clan that bought this building about how many people were furious about this. Byron Wilson, the first guy on our list, was actually the secretary of the local clan chapter, so they didn't reveal who they were. This building is going to play a large role in the Marion County clan conclave. Try to say that three times fast. <laughs> That is their year of glory in Marion, 1924. They've got their headquarters on North State Street. And that is going to be featured in this festival of sorts, which is what the conclave is. And what they're going to do is have parades. They're going to use the fairgrounds. They're going to have all kinds of lectures and speakers and music, everything going on. This shows them in a parade. They took a very long parade from the fairgrounds, um, went downtown, ended up on Greenwood Street, went past President Harding's house and were ordered to salute as they went by, and went down Church Street uh, all the way back to the fairgrounds. So everybody knew what they were doing. Then they went to the receiving vault at the Marion Cemetery where President Harding's body was. Mrs. Harding had not died yet. And they take a little PR shot here in front of the receiving vault. Now the Klan actually imploded pretty quickly with when you consider all the influence it had during the 1920s. And that was mostly because they had corruption in their leadership. That David Stevenson, the one who had the house at Buckeye Lake, he's charged with murder and rape. That doesn't go over well when your leader does that. Other leaders in Atlanta, they're involved in embezzlement of Klan funds. And when the leaders fall, there's no substance left. Remember I said that they curtailed their message from community to community, which was really good in building the chapters but it has no cohesiveness as far as what you stand for as this huge national organization. It's very splintered, and then there's confusion over what is the message, what is remaining, so it doesn't go anywhere. Um, not saying that the Klansmen didn't stay in some areas, they certainly did, but they kind of go back underground. And the building in Marion, the Criterion is what they called it, they couldn't support it either. And by the end of 1924, they can't pay the bills and it's sold to the Brushmore Newspaper Company, which of course has the Marion Star. Um, and the Marion Star moves its operation from East Center Street over to that building. So I know I've heard around town before that Warren Hardy rented space to the Klan. That's where this comes from, It's confusion in this story. Warren Harding, as we know, had nothing to do with that building, um, and certainly he didn't have anything to do with the Klan. Um, this, it was that chain of purchase and sale through that period where it went from the KFC to the Klan and then to Brushmore. Um, so, you know, I guess in the end we were left thinking uh, how something like this could happen how many people could be taken in by this kind of rhetoric. But again, um, it was the times, um, it can happen at any time in history, when the events swirl around, people feel downtrodden, they feel threatened, that they, their way of life is going by the wayside. Um, but it's, uh, it was an interesting time, but certainly a dangerous time in our country's history. And certainly something that was very prevalent in the Harding administration was dealing with this. And so I think the more we learn about all those issues that the president had to deal with, 
uh, the more we can appreciate what he did and how he handled himself. That's all I have. You have questions for me. You talked about this conclave on State Street, you said? That's where their, the headquarters building was, the, the old Star building on North State Street. It was When the Star was there, it was 150 Court Street because they changed the front of the building to face Court Street. It's where the Star has been. Until fairly recently. Yeah, and you're talking about that building. I am. Okay. Yes. And that, that's where this conclave was held? The conclave is the festival. Yeah. They called that building the Criterion Auditorium Company. Everything had the, the K or the C thing in it, the theme. But yeah, that, that was going to be their headquarters, and it was for about eight months. Mm -hmm. But it was not their, you know, their long-term glory as they envisioned. Randy. The conclave, the very public library, I assume they still do have a copy of the program, the order of events and so forth for that Marion County plan conclave. Oh, you can see that past three times, but they uh, yeah. had a photocopy of that program available in the higher room. Well, everything's moved around up there now. I have no idea where it is now, but okay. we've Once seen they get it put it. back together again. Yeah, Randy furnished me one, and then uh, Phil Reed gave me another <laughs> copy of it because, of course, the library didn't have it available right now. But it's a whole program, and, it, and it's got their, the history of our country according to the Klan, which, which is an interesting history. Um, but, you know, it was a, it was, they were huge, huge events. And, you know, I talked about the events over in Buckeye Lake. They had inner urban lines running from Zanesville and Newark and Columbus over to Buckeye Lake. They rented these whole inner urban lines and shipped people in and, and it was a huge, huge deal. And in the urban station was right beside the Marion Star there. Right. So they could connect to anything. Right. I didn't know that. I guess I should say this because it's fuzzy, cause, but my mother lived in Meeker. And when she was a girl, she told about going out to a thing with the clans and how scary it was. Well, yeah, I think. When she was born, so that picture could have been, because she would have been eight years old. In 1922. Yeah, I think that you, if she you saw this going on, especially as a kid or whatever. Well, I think she curious. was, it was her father, because she always, and as I say, I shouldn't say because it's fuzzy and, and probably was fuzzy. She was saying about going to something when the clans were there and how scary it was, and her, some guy walked up to her dad. So, I mean, there was the family was, and that it was someone he knew because his father was upset. But as I say, this was something my mother told me when I was a child, and that's all I remember was her telling him about boy. But as I say, she lived in Meeker, and that was yeah. She was been eight years old at that time. What about the gypsies and uh, the clan? They would certainly be against the gypsies. Oh, gypsies. absolutely. And see, there's a, always a big collection of yeah. gypsy camp encampments uh, west of Meeker. On the road. Uh, she never talked about the gypsy. I just never talked about the clans. <laughs> <laughs> and as I say, it's fuzzy. Oh, it's interesting that they're there, you know. Okay, I'll try to repeat what everybody's saying. Because you are facing this way, oh. probably can't hear as well. Did you? I actually got a theory to throw out at you about your, your Indian. Okay. Because I know that the clan being a major nativist based organization. The Indian chief was always a symbol of nativity, which they was brought out during the 1860s against the immigrant rush, and I'm wondering if that carried over to the 1920s. It could, and, and the interesting thing too is, of course, Native Americans were not U.S. citizens in the early 20s. Harding was trying to push for that. So yeah, I don't know what category the, the Native American guy is in at all. But, and I looked back even in their tenants, I thought, okay, are they gonna list Native Americans? Where are they? And I couldn't find any listing. They got everybody else listed, <laughs> but they don't have Native Americans address. Yeah, but maybe he must be a symbol because he's got his whole headdress on. He also looked like the whitest Indian chief I've ever seen in the photograph. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so you're saying the clans were my them. They yeah. might have just skewed that one a little bit. Yeah, that could be, that could be. Any other questions for me? Here. Hey, I'm wondering, because I know you mentioned this little book about black flight, and um, you talked about only um, in relationship to Harding's time, because I know that's your area of expertise. But I'm wondering if that influenced um, 
African, the African American population in our town. And uh, my second piece to that is, I know you stopped at like 1924. I'm wondering um, where, if any, can we continue this timeline to uh, understand and look at the Klan's influence in Marion? Because I'm hearing even today that you know the Klan exists in Marion. So my question is twofold about you know the influence of the Klan as far as it impacted African Americans here in a continuum as far as your timeline is concerned. I think that just the existence of the Klan in your town would have intimidated you as an African American, of course. Um, and certainly, they are continuing their bigotry against African Americans. They just added Catholics and Jews and everybody else to the mix. Um, I think that murder in 1919 is a perfect illustration of that and um, that's a fascinating case because the this woman was found dead in a field on David Street and in the Erie Yards these the railroad workers they decided to want to it's an african-american worker that did it there's no evidence or anything and they're going to lynch him and the police actually come and take him to the the jail to keep him safe but you know it's a bigotry was alive and well against african-americans for sure and as far as the second part of your question about how far we could take the timeline we could keep going absolutely um, there is no doubt, and you know, we see this maybe on social media or anywhere else, that there is, this kind of thinking is certainly still around, unfortunately. Um, so we could absolutely keep building on it. Because did you see, um, when you posted on Facebook, you know, some of the, the Klan and Marion, I don't want to go there, you know, and stuff, I mean, it was just really vibrant, the response, and people didn't understand that it was a presentation, yeah. you know, and it was like, you know, when I told people I was going to a presentation about the plan, you know, they're like, what is wrong with you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I said, it's something, you know, that it's interesting, you know, my classmate's doing this, and I said, I just wanted to find out, but I, I'm so glad. That'll, that. that'll be the next rumor that I'm heading up on the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'll have to look on Facebook and see if that comes up. But yeah, exactly right. And when I first put this on our events, I had a, a woman email me and say, she was disgusted that I was doing this topic. And I said, well, it's, it's part of history, and history is really messy. <laughs> and it was certainly part of what President Hardy had to deal with. And it was alive and well in every town. And she said, well, you're going to bring the national media down on Marion. And I said, oh, they have to pick every town in the country if they're going to do this, because it was everywhere. Well, I think, Phil, that you, uh, weren't you invited to do uh, some type of a discussion about the plan or something um, during uh, maybe last year or something you declined to do some historical stuff? Were you able to, I don't know, I, I just think it's a hot button that people um, you know, race relations and dialogue, it's just a hot topic. It is, and remember I was on that panel with you at the yeah. library, mm -hmm. and it is still, it, of course, it's a very hot topic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you, that you need to understand what's happened in the mm -hmm. past, and everything comes around and loops around over and over again in history, and I think it's important to understand as much as we can what people were thinking and what made them act and say the things that they did. I mean, I could have gone on for another two hours with the fascinating things and the rather disgusting things that I was learning about towns all over the state. Uh, the minstrel shows that everybody sponsored and all the fraternal organizations sponsored. and. Um, you know, it just, but it was everywhere. It was prevalent. I don't think people gave it a second thought in the white community, unfortunately. And that was just the way society was. And, but I think it's worth dissecting and talking about. Any other questions for me here? Is it still that Harding was in a thorn in the side of the Klan. They ended this conclave uh, parade. They went by his 
his uh, where he was buried. What what was that all about? Was that because they want to be seen as patriotic. Okay. As I said, they were 100% American. They're patriotic. Plus, we don't know how many of the rank and file Klansmen believed what their leaders were telling them that Harding was a Klansman. Maybe they thought this was one of their brothers they were honoring. I guess. You know, um, I would tend to think that a lot of them were told that he was a Klansman and they're paying their respects. But again, remember they're, they're all about the outward appearances. They want to be seen as paying their respects just like the Masons would, just like the Elks would. And after Harding's death, everybody was having memorial services and prayer services everywhere. And they wanted to be seen as a pillar of the community, strange as it is. By what year was, was the clan that you said they, they went downhill quickly? What, oh, what by the late 20s, they're going to be pretty much out of it. So we're talking really a decade of this resurgence, and they are very public. And then at the end of the 20s, they go kind of underground again. They splinter, they fall apart. And I think a lot has to do with the Great Depression coming in the 30s. You know, there's no way that they, people are going to pay attention to going after all these other groups when they're trying to feed them their families, you know. I think that kind of superseded the interest in this. Plus there just was no structure to it. It was just all talk. There wasn't anything behind it at all. Because remember the guy that find, founds it, he is interested in the regalia. He likes the mystique of it. And he makes up all the rituals. But there's really nothing else behind it. It's all for show. There's a lot of hate groups in Ohio now. Is there any connection with the old clan? And the I think they've got to be, had to have an evolution that's occurred. I think it's dipped. I think it rises and it dips and then it emerges in a different fashion. Different way. Um, certainly, I think after World War II, you had more of the white supremacy groups being influenced by the Nazis. You know. You, it depends on what world events are happening, and then they kind of grasp onto that, and that's their new identity. And through the 60s, you know, through civil rights, well, that's going to be the impetus. Mm -hmm. So it's going to kind of ebb and flow according to what events are going on. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's alive and well. It's just in a different form. Different form. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is it possible since the Klan really didn't keep any official public records that like uh, Summit County having a uh, 70,000 Klan membership was actually an inflated figure by the Klan to make them look more inclusive? I think they, I think they inflated their numbers a lot. Um, the, the, uh, the Buckeye Lake uh, conclaves, that was, um, the police giving that number, and they knew because they're they're on the inner urban, so they could yeah. kind of keep better track of that. But yeah, I think they inflated. They would, you know, that article I have where they were going to offer 500 to 1500 Marion City and County men to help the police force. Come on, I, I'm I'm not buying that. But they they want to be seen as a force to be reckoned with, and that's going to be published in the newspaper. <coughs> They want people to do just like I did, 500 or 1,500. You know, that's incredible. Because they, they want to be seen as a force to be reckoned with. And they want to be seen as mainstream. Weird as that sounds. They want to be seen as mainstream. I don't have a question, but I've got an interesting personal story to tell okay. from my family. Uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, uh, was Roy Steinhelfer. I don't know if anyone remembers the Stein Upper Market up in North Maine, the, I mean, the Nichols Bakery property and all that. So he was uh, a known businessman in his day. And it was during the 20s. And he wouldn't talk about it himself because he never liked to brag on himself. But um, my grandmother told me and my mother both that he was approached by a Klan member to join one time. And my grandfather was a devout Christian, and he had no desire to join the Klan. And in fact, he put himself at risk because
because he said, no, I don't care to belong to an organization where the members are hidden behind sheets. <laughs> so uh, he risked, he had a cross burned on his property, I'm sure. But no one ever retaliated, but I was always really proud of my grandfather for taking that stand for what he believed in. Well, yeah, and the Klan was known to leave business cards at your, house, your place of business and say, you know, this is a friendly call this time, but next time it won't be so friendly. You know, they, they were out and out threats. Well, you might have wanted him to put something like that in his, one of his businesses. It's interesting in that program for the Marion County Conclave, the businesses advertising in that, um, and not saying that they were members or supporters of the Klan, you don't know that, but a lot in Oakland Heights, um, one of them, and I don't remember, Randy, which one it was, said 100% American, which was an overt sign that, yes, we're behind you. Um, it might have just been another opportunity for most of these businesses to say, oh, we've got extra folks in town that day, maybe I can get the business. Um, but it's interesting to see the ones that decided to advertise on that as well. Any other questions for me? Well, I appreciate you participating in this discussion. That's one thing I always like about our programs. I like it when everybody kind of participates. Um, we'll be back here next week at 7 o'clock for the Harding Letters Revisited. Um, we're going to dissect the relationship of Warren Harding and Gary Phillips, and then we're going to make it even more complicated by bringing Nan Britton into the picture. So it'll be a soap opera of sorts. Um, so hopefully we'll see you right back here. Drop breadcrumbs so you remember how to get back to this building. Um, but hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>